Right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming to today's public talk. Um, as I just said, I'm Craig Roger. I'm from the University of Otago in Dunedin, New Zealand. So that's down here in the South Island of New Zealand. Uh, we are the oldest university in New Zealand, and until recently we were the most southern university in the world. So that was really great in terms of our media and marketing, and then our polytechnic in uh, the southern part of, I think, Argentina declared itself to be a university, and we can't make that claim anymore. But nonetheless, we're the oldest university in New Zealand, and we're a very southern university by the standards of the world. Um, so, uh, Dunedin, uh, you may have come across the word Dunedin before, it's not Dunedin, it is Dunedin. There is a Dunedin, Florida. Uh, which is very irritating if you're a New Zealander and when you try and do a Google search for good restaurants you get a big list of restaurants in Florida. However, anyway, I'm here to talk to you about space. I want to take you back in time initially to 1958. 1957, 1958 was the International Geophysical Year and geophysicists in many disciplines all around the world agreed to try and study the Earth and to increase our understandings of the Earth. And as part of this effort, the United States launched, successfully launched, I should say, the first US satellite into orbit. And this was a big thing at the time. I mean, this was a big thing internationally. Uh, it turns out, earlier this year, I got my house remodeled, okay? And they ripped out my bathroom and rebuilt my bathroom. And in the walls of my bathroom, they found a whole lot of Australian newspapers. That sounds very strange, because we're from New Zealand, which is different from Australia, but for some strange reason, the walls of my house were full of Australian newspapers from the 50s, and I went through them and I found the front page, which said, US launches moon. And at that stage, they weren't satellites, they weren't spacecraft, they were artificial moons. Pretty cool, eh? It's a shame we lost that terminology. Um, <laughs> Okay, so Explorer 1 was the first US artificial moon put into orbit. The second successful spacecraft into orbit it came after Sputnik 1, which was a shiny ball that went beep. Explorer 1 carried an actual scientific experiment on board. It carried a Geiger counter. It's a very simple experiment. That's why it was put on the very first spacecraft. The intention was to go study cosmic rays, which are hot particles that come out of deep, deep, deep space. You know, somewhere maybe in our galaxy, maybe beyond. And we knew over time that as you got higher and higher in altitude, you got a little bit more of these cosmic rays. And so James Van Allen of the University of Iowa, who was interested in this, got a Geiger counter put on Explorer 1, and it was stuck on a rocket and boosted up into orbit so he could go study cosmic rays. But that's not what happened. They couldn't study cosmic rays, because when they got the data back, they found that it was full of hot radioactive particles. And Carl McElwain, James Van Allen's PhD student, proclaimed, my God, space is radioactive. They had discovered what we now know as the Van Allen radiation belts, which are hot, charged electrons and protons, hot particles trapped in the Earth's magnetic field, going bounce, 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 in this, with the structure of, of uh, hot particles in space. Okay, so that was discovered back in 1958 and named after James Van Allen. Now I really like this photograph. This is the photograph from the post-launch press conference. They were so pleased when this had worked. I mean, they'd blown up several rockets on the pad trying to get them into space, which was very embarrassing. So this one worked. Okay, so these three gentlemen are holding a one-to-one -one scale model of Explorer 1. It wasn't that big. And here you have Werner von Braun, James Van Allen, and Bill Pickering, who were the masterminds of this. Werner von Braun designed the rocket, uh, James Van Allen was the scientist, the PI in charge of the experiment, and Bill Pickering was the head of the jet propulsion lab that managed the mission. And right at the dawn of the space age, you have a German, an American, and a New Zealander. Because Bill Pickering was a New Zealander, he did high school, and up to his early university days, in New Zealand before he came to the United States and went to Caltech. And just as a slight irony in the way that New Zealand works, it's a very small country, um, Bill Pickering actually went to the same primary school that Ernest Rutherford had gone to. Ernest Rutherford being the guy who discovered the, 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 the structure of the atom, discovered the nucleus. 
Okay, so right at the beginning of the dawn of the space age, it was a very international effort, and that international effort is continuing today. When you look at the basic structure of the radiation belts, we still recognize an outer belt, an inner belt, and a slot region separating them. We've learned much more about what's happening in space and where the Van Allen radiation belts fit in. But even though they were discovered in 1958, which is a fairly long time ago really, there are a lot of major serious science questions around the Van Allen belts that are still in existence. And that's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm still in operation at the moment. Okay, so uh, this is the basic structure. Just want to get, get you a feeling that it's a three-dimensional structure. It's a, a torus, or given we're in the United States, it's a donut. Uh, surrounding the Earth, with the Earth in the middle. The structure is caused by the magnetic field of the Earth, which is a three-dimensional thing. Now, when you look at this donut-shaped uh, thing, you can get the impression that it's uh, a very static, a very static thing, the radiation belts. So that it's just, oh, well, you know, there's about this much here, and about this much there, and about this much there. But in practice, the radiation belts are incredibly dynamic. And this is the cause of a lot of the scientific interest that we have today. You know, the radiation belts, the fluxes can be sort of low, and then they go up, but up, but up, but up, and the fluxes get higher and higher and higher, and they go up by a factor of 10, 100, 1,000 times. And then, suddenly, they go down, back to the same sort of levels. And, and the process is fast. Now, how fast is it? Well, actually, I don't think we know how fast it is. Because every time we launch a satellite into space to study the radiation belts, and it has better quality experiments on board, the time scales get smaller. So if you look in the literature, and you look at the literature from 10 years ago, they say, oh, the processes are very fast. They're days. Things are happening in days. And then you look at the literature from maybe five years ago before the Van Allen probes were launched, and they say, oh, the processes are very fast. It's, it's tens of hours, maybe a day. And now we're starting to say, the processes are very fast. It's like a couple of hours for these things to happen. Okay, so there's all this interest in how the fluxes can go up and down so quickly. What? Where is the fundamental source of this dynamism? And it's the sun. I mean, all the energy input for the, solar, for the, for the Earth system, with the exception of a little bit of radioactivity, is coming from the sun. We often have this view of the sun as an unchanging body that just sits out there gently burning away roughly 150 million kilometers away from us. Okay, but if we could see the sun properly, we would realize just how dynamic and changeable it is. Now, of course, this is a big problem for us because the sun is very bright. And when you look at the sun, well, you immediately decide not to look at the sun because it's very bright. But if you are interested in the sun, you can conduct science to try and understand it better. And so one of the first things you do is, if you want to understand what's coming off the sun, you stick something in front of the sun to block out the glare from the sun itself, and then you can see the glowing gases that are coming away from the sun. It turns out that the surface of the sun is so hot, it is literally boiling away into space. Now that's actually remarkable, because if you think about it, the sun has a huge gravitational attraction, you know, it's big, and you wouldn't think that the matter of the sun would be able to get away, but it does. It's actually boiling off the surface, because the surface is so hot, and it's gently wafting out in all directions away from the sun. We call this the solar wind, and during normal conditions, it gently blows past the earth at about 400 kilometers a second, okay? So it's just coming by all the time. So if we have a look at an interesting time period, I have a movie here, which this will work, it will work, come on, it's going to work. It's the kick. It's not responding. Wait for the program to respond. That's very irritating. Ah, but it did respond. Okay, so I have a movie in here. What we're going to do is we're going to be looking at the sun, and of course, again, we can't look at the sun directly, we have to put a barrier in front of the sun. And in fact, in this particular thing, we're going to see two barriers in front of the sun. And there's going to be a blacked out region here. And the reason for the blacked out region is because well, we have to put an arm to put the disc to black out the sun. Okay? So, we look at the sun. So you see the white dots around us initially, that's stars. Aha! And you see the sun exploding clouds of gas out into space. And these are called coronal mass ejections. Explosions on the sun which toss massive quantities of matter out into space. 
Now hopefully I can get that movie to play again, because it's very nice. So you'll see most of these things are most of these things are stars, they move very gently. You might actually see a few planets going by. Okay. So we see this gentle and then boof in that direction, and then boof in that direction. If you look closely just at the end of the movie, it all becomes speckly. Now that's actually because that cloud of material from the coronal mass ejection is striking the spacecraft and it's changing the way the camera works. So with a coronal mass ejection, when you're looking at the sun, imagine I'm standing here with a shotgun. Okay, now I can normally do this in LG New Zealand and no one is worried, but really there is no shotgun. Okay? <laughs> right, so I'm standing here with a shotgun. Imagine I'm the sun. You point it this way, I pull the trigger, you will see this cloud of shot go away from the sun. You'll see a coronal mass ejection fired to the side. Then I swing over here and pull the trigger. Poof! Coronal mass ejection over here. Now I point it at you and pull the trigger. And briefly, you will see this ring of shot coming towards you. That's called a full halo. Okay, that's the science term for it. When we have experiments like this out in space, staring at the sun, and they see a full halo heading towards them, that generally means that the coronal mass ejection is coming for us. And it's going to compress the magnetic field of the Earth, and it's going to start processes in the Van Allen radiation belts which cause the acceleration of these particles. Exactly how does it work? We have great ideas, but we're not absolutely sure, and that's why we have to do the science around here while we're launching missions. And when I say we, I mean you, are launching missions into space to try and study this. People are particularly focused on what's called killer electrons. Now, killer electrons is not a name that you use in a scientific conference. That is for a public presentation like this, because it sounds good. Okay, so roughly more than one MeV, which is very energetic, a killer electron are highly effective at damaging and disrupting spacecraft. They're so energetic they will go through the walls of the spacecraft and potentially land themselves somewhere in the electronics. And of course, this can cause long-term, you can imagine it as cancer, long-term damage to the satellite as it's being bombarded by killer electrons. But you can also get a magic bullet effect where that electron arrives just at the piece of memory which on the computer chip that knows how to do something important. A classic example would be that little bit of the computer memory which knows how to talk back to Earth. If it forgets how to talk back to Earth, the satellite continues doing what it wants to do, but it's no good to you anymore. Okay, so that's one of the main reasons that we can justify the physics behind what we're doing, because, hey, these satellites might die or go away or something. If we look at the relative location of the orbits of most satellites, relative to the radiation belts, the outer radiation belt is where the geosynchronous satellites are, which is weather and communications. Uh, the medium Earth orbiting satellites pass through the, uh, the, outer, the inner part of the outer radiation belt. A good example of that would be GPS. Uh, there, oh, sorry, that's, that's elliptical orbits. The, the MEO orbits are more or less in the slot, which is good. And then things that are very close to the Earth will be touching the inner radiation belt. If we have a look at the uh, geostationary orbits, as of today there is roughly 410 operational satellites in geostationary orbit, and they cost on the order of 200 million US dollars to build, and roughly 100 million US dollars to launch into geostationary orbit. So they're a very expensive thing to go away on the whim of the sun, which we would like to understand better. So let me give you an example of this, Galaxy 15. Galaxy 15 is an American geostationary communication satellite launched in uh, October 2005 out of French Guiana via European Space Agency rocket. Uh, now, in April 2010, Galaxy 5 was zombified. Okay, the spacecraft went into a crazy state where it broadcast uncontrollably and drifted out of control around the world. Okay, and it just kept going around the world broadcasting. Anytime it got past close to another satellite, it interfered with the ability of that satellite to talk to the Earth because it was out of control and they had to make satellites move a little bit and try and get out of the way and change operations because Galaxy 15 was zombified and they weren't going to quite sure what was going to happen because it kept getting power. It was going to keep running for ages and ages. It was just out of control. Thankfully, eventually, the angle of the solar panels changed, the batteries ran down, and those clever space engineers had set up an automatic reset when the power went low. So it rebooted itself, came back to life, unzombified itself, and said, hello, where am I? 
and they were able to take control of it and drive it back to where it was meant to be, and it's in operation today. Now, we can go away and look at what happened to Galaxy 15. Well, how did it become zombified? Okay, and oops, that's, so I've told that story. Here's the drifting of it and the various other spacecraft that it interfered with as it drifted around the world. If we go and look at electron data, particle data, on the day that it went crazy, just at the time that it went crazy, there's this huge burst of particles. And it turns out, this is right on the night side of the Earth, this is a phenomenon called a substorm. In the simplest way of imagining this, you've got basically the, the magnetic field of the Earth is like a big rubber band. Okay, and this particular substorm was a real doozy. So the rubber band gets pulled back and back and back and back, and it's like a big catapult. Let it go, and poof, all these particles get fired into the Earth. It makes beautiful aurora. That's nice. That's a nice thing. But if you happen to be a satellite stuck between where the aurora is going and where the rubber band is coming, you're in, you're in an issue. And it turned out Galaxy 15 was just there. And I did a study with some friends of mine a couple of years ago where we found that that particular substorm was in the 0.1% level of gruntiness. It was, the strong, it was one of the really unusually strong substorms. Galaxy 15 was in the wrong place at the wrong time, got turned into a zombie in space. So we're going to understand all these dynamic changes, those fast flux increases and those fast uh, flux decreases. We would do that, we could do that by describing a very simplistic equation. The number of electrons with time is going to depend on the number of electrons we start off with, plus some process which accelerates them and some process which makes them go away. Now it turns out that lots of people all over the world like to do this acceleration process because it's cool. How do you make these electrons so energetic? Because they don't start that way. Very cool. It's something that people have been interested in for decades. In fact, Dan Baker, the director of LASP, has been working in this area for decades. I don't do that. I'm a loss person. I'm interested in the losses into the atmosphere. That's my little niche, is where do those particles go? How do we understand the losses with time? And if you look at these particles, they're initially trapped in the Earth's magnetic field, and then they're perturbed, they're knocked towards the atmosphere, they end up falling down the magnetic field lines into the Arctic and the Antarctic. And so in between these two red lines is basically the region, it's controlled by the magnetic field, which is quite slightly offset. Now the regions in the atmosphere where these particles deposit the majority of their energy. And this has, unfortunately, given me many opportunities to travel to the Arctic and to the Antarctic to put it in scientific experiments, because science is tough, you know? Okay, so let's just quickly think about the particle motion and how we can understand what's going on. So we have an electron trapped in the magnetic field. That's one of the many electrons in the radiation belt. Its dominant motion is because it's a charged particle in a magnetic field, it's going to go around in a circle. Okay, that's called cyclotron motion. If you've done pretty basic physics, you may remember that a charged particle in a magnetic field is going to go around in a circle. To give you a feeling, this is going to happen very roughly a thousand times a second. Maybe 10,000 times a second. I can't go this fast, okay? That's as fast as I can go. But that gives you a feeling. At the same time, the particle, when it's trapped, is bouncing along the magnetic field line, bouncing between the hemispheres. Okay? Between, 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 between. And so, to give you a feeling on the time scale again, if it starts here and does that, it takes about a second. Okay, one Mississippi, no, one Mississippi, bit fast, about that. Now remember, these field lines are long. A typical field line would be the distance from here to there would be about 5,000 Earth radii. So very roughly 20,000 miles. Okay, and it's doing that whole distance in about a second. So, let's go around like this, a thousand times a second. It's doing that once a second. And it's also drifting around the world. Drifting around the world because the magnetic field is slightly anisotropic. Uh, drift around the world, but it only takes 10 or 15 minutes to go once around the world. So it's quite slow motion. So you have these particles and they're basically doing this. Here's your particle, <coughs> down the field line. Bounce, back again. And that's the life of a trapped particle, the life of a trapped electron, until that gets disturbed and it gets knocked into the atmosphere. So how do we understand this motion? You can forget all the complexity there. It all comes down to what we call the pitch angle. 
The pitch angle is the angle, is an angle that you measure between the magnetic field and the velocity vector of the, of the electron. Okay, so if the pitch angle is 90 degrees, that means that the electron is just spinning in space. It has no parallel component, it just sits there. If it's zero degrees, it's running right along the field line. And it just keeps going. In fact, it keeps going until it hits the Earth, or the atmosphere, really. Until it hits something solid and then it's lost. And so we know that particles at 90 degrees, electrons with a pitch angle of 90 degrees, will be trapped. And an electron with a pitch angle of 0 degrees will be lost into the atmosphere. In practice, the location where it is going to land depends, so the altitude on which it's going to land depends on the pitch angle. And we end up saying that if it's going to hit 100 kilometers or below, it's going to be lost. And that defines a range of angles for which the electrons will be lost, and we call that the bounce loss cone. And if you're interested in losses from the atmosphere, you want to measure the electrons in the bounce loss cone. So, you want to measure this. Okay, you want to measure that there. And that sounds easy. And there are many really clever space engineers all over the world, but particularly around here in the front range. And so it sounds great. And in practice, it's not easy. It's actually really hard to do to make that measurement. And what doesn't help is that if you're interested in just these particles that are trapped, over here at the different angles, there are many, many, many more particles that are not trapped. Thousands, tens of thousands more trapped particles. And the moment that you measure your, your, the, the range of angles you measure is just slightly too big, you're stuffed. Because you'll be swamped, you'll be overwhelmed by the trapped particles. So it's difficult to measure. In fact, it gets even harder. If you go up to geostationary orbit, where most of the interesting things are, the loss cone shrinks to be about two or three degrees wide. You know? So like the width of my finger at a distance. So that's quite a small angle that you have to get right all the time if you're going to make those measurements. So it's quite tough. And in practice there are not actually very many satellites which make this measurement. There's some which make that measurement, which sounds a bit wacky, they measure the particles just outside the loss cone, but it turns out that's not very hard to do, and so people do that. There is one series of satellites flown by the US National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration which do measure inside the loss cone. But they're not quite perfect. Of course, life is never perfect. What you want is that, and what you get is that. Okay, so they're measuring part of it, and that's great. And don't let me knock them, because they're really useful, but they're only going to give you part of the picture at any given time. Particularly given you can imagine the particles might be slipping down that hole there, where they're just not looking. So it turns out I have gone for a really different uh, approach for trying to measure the loss of particles into the atmosphere. Instead of doing something, frankly, expensive, like building an experiment, sticking it in a, in a spacecraft, putting it on the biggest firework known to man, and shooting it up into space. I do all my work from the ground using radio waves. And we use the atmosphere as a particle detector. Because we are interested in the loss of particles from the radiation belts, the loss of electrons in the radiation belts, into the atmosphere. And so if we use the atmosphere as a particle detector, we're not going, we shouldn't get it wrong. We should only measure the electrons which are going to hit the atmosphere because we're measuring them hitting the atmosphere. We shouldn't measure any of the ones which don't hit the atmosphere because we can't see them. So, what happens when um, an electron hits the atmosphere? My mental picture here is something like Marvin the Martian, the cartoon character from Werner Brothers. So he's running around in space with a ray gun and he basically points it down and goes Bzzzt! and he zaps the atmosphere, and that's this beam of electrons coming out of space. The energy is deposited in the atmosphere. Depending on the energy of the ray gun, it penetrates deeper and deeper and deeper into the atmosphere. So you can all, almost imagine Marvin the Martian having, having a volume knob, where he can make the energy of the beam bigger and bigger. And as he makes the energy of the beam bigger, it'll get deeper into the atmosphere, closer to the ground. So a... Uh, Roughly a, a 100 keV electron will deposit the majority of its energy at about uh, 80 kilometers altitude, and a 4 MeV electron will deposit the majority of its uh, energy at about 45 kilometers altitude. So that's the sort of um, electrons that we're very interested in. So the process by which I tend to work 
sometimes I use satellites, obviously, um, is to use a form of poor man's radar. So you have a source that's launching radio waves. Those radio waves bounce off the charged part of the atmosphere, which is called the ionosphere. And uh, we can then pick up those radio waves here on the ground uh, with a VLF receiver. So we're particularly using what's known as very low frequency waves. And these are waves with a, with a, a frequency of about 20 kilohertz, which means a wavelength of about 20 miles. So big wavelengths, you know, big wavelengths. And I call this poor man's radar because by scientific standards, I'm a poor man. And the thing is, I don't have to pay for this bit. I don't pay for the transmitter. I just pay for this bit, the receiver. And so this is about, um, my antennas are sort of a little bit high on this door. Okay, so they're not very impressive actually, they're not very big. Whereas these things are huge. And given I'm here in the United States, surrounded by American taxpayers, I have to say to you, thank you very much. Because <laughs> you are paying for this. You are paying to make me happy. It's very kind of you. Okay, so these huge VLF transmitters, very low frequency transmitters, broadcasting 24 hours a day generally, with most of the energy trapped between uh, the ground and the conducting ionosphere. And when precipitation comes in, the electrical properties of the atmosphere are changed because bzzz, Marvin the Martian has fired energy into the ionosphere, and so the radio wave changes, and we can detect that as a change in the received signal. And so as long as somebody pays for this, we can keep operation. Now I want to show you one of my favorite VLF transmitters. It is paid for by you. It's located here on the far northwest of Australia. It has call sign NWC, Northwest Cape. Most of, them, most of the call signs don't mean anything. That's an unusual example. Uh, it is operating at 19.8 kilohertz. It radiates one megawatt, one million watts of power. Now, I said to you the wavelength is about 20 miles. Okay, now that's big. It turns out if you do Maxwell's equations, you do a little bit of electromagnetic theory, if you want to build an antenna that's going to efficiently radiate a radio wave, you want it to be a minimum of a quarter of a wavelength or five miles high. Okay? Obviously, if people were building five high mile towers, you would know about that. There'd be TV shows about people jumping off them and stuff. You know, it would be cool. We can't build five high mile towers. So what we do is we build much smaller towers. Ah, but they're not very efficient. That's okay. We'll just put more energy in. We'll just heat the ground up a lot. And that way we can get our one million watts out. So, you know, it's a little bit unclear, but the efficiency is somewhere between five and 10%. So something like 10 to 20 million watts of energy goes in to providing 1 million watts out. Let's look at MWC a little bit more closely. Google Earth is a wonderful toy. We'll zoom in and you start seeing what looks like an alien landing site. Okay, so there's a central tower and then a ring of six towers around it and then a ring of six towers around that and there are wires strung between these towers. And just to give you a feeling, that central tower is more than a thousand feet high. Okay, which is, of course, nowhere near five miles, but it's very tall. So it's this huge complex. Now, who? Who would spend this level of money? Who would go to Australia and build this huge complex? And this is just one of many. Who would put 20 million watts of energy in and make the ground in Australia quite warm? And rather, you've got to be careful getting out of cars around there, because if you put one foot in the car and one foot on the ground, a current will flow where you don't want a current flowing. Okay, they call it being bitten. You jump from your car. Okay, right? Who would go to so much trouble? Who would do that on behalf of the US taxpayer? And it's the US military. Thank you very much. In fact, it's Go Navy. It's the US Navy. These transmitters are used to talk to submarines. It's kill the skin depth effect because of this very long wavelength. The evanescent mode, I don't need to worry about that. It turns out that a little bit of energy leaks underwater. Tens of meters, you know, 50 feet or something. It's a little bit of a secret how far, but you can do the calculations, it's not that hard. Uh, and so you can sit in your submarine and they can talk to you from home. 
Now, for most submarines, this is not really that interesting. But if your mission is to sit there and be ready to reach out and touch somebody in a sort of a no sense, uh, I'm going to reach out and nuke you all. Okay, that sort of sense. <laughs> if you're living in a ballistic missile sub, you need to know when to do the action, when to turn the key, when to blow up the world. And how do you find out? It's these things. They spend their time telling you everything is fine. The world is still there. Let us tell you the baseball scores. Here is a telegram from your family. This is all true. I know people who work as US Navy engineers. They send the baseball scores this way. That's fine. Do you remember old modems? You know, really old modems? Maybe we had internet over the phone line. These things are 200 bored. Okay? So even sending a telegram will take a while. There's not a lot of information flowing down, but nonetheless, you can stay underwater for months and months and months, and you can know the world is still there. So these transmitters are very expensive. They're very important. Thank you for paying for them. And they're always on because you don't want the guys in the, in the subs with the bombs to get worried. So you leave them running all the time, and if you're going to turn them off for maintenance, some dusting or something, you do it on an agreed time. They go off once a week, seven hours. They always go off at click the same time. So the guys in the subs are not troubled. Okay, so we have built a network of receivers. We call it our Artwark, the Antarctic Arctic Radiation Belt Dynamic Deposition VLF Atmospheric Research Consortium. It's one of those names, when you're from a small country, you need ways of standing out. So coming up with a nice <laughs> name is that. So all of these red diamonds are one of our receivers. They're cheap, they're mostly in the Antarctic and the Arctic, because that's where the radiation belts, the magnetic field maps down into the polar regions, so that's where we want to be, that's where the action is. The transmitters are the green dots, they're not all US Navy, although actually most of them are. Um, that one's not, that one's not. And these ones are sort of half NATO, and so they're half local and half NATO. The British actually have two. They have one for NATO and one that's ours. Right? They're, quite, they're only about um, 30 miles away from one another. You can drive between them. But one is NATO people are allowed to use, and the other one is no, it's very proper. Okay? So I always find it interesting, you can sort of see if a country is going to invest seriously in having ballistic missile submarines because they put in a transmitter, because these things are less expensive than building ballistic missile submarines, and it's a good training ground. So the Indians started doing this about 10 years ago, and they started off broadcasting in plain Morse code. And if you read Morse code, you could actually see it was a weather forecast. You know, the idea that in, in, even 10 years ago, the idea that somebody was sending out a weather forecast in that very, very slow way really amazed me. I'm also amazed that the Chinese don't seem to have one yet, but we may just not be looking in the right place. Every now and again, I get asked by people from interesting organizations in the United States to go, could I have a look at this frequency and stuff? There's some suggestion of a transmitter in Tibet, apparently. Okay, so this is our artwork. Those are the paths that we're monitoring. We obviously have really strong coverage over here, largely because of the great collection of uh, transmitters here in uh, North America and in Europe. Okay, so what do I do with the artwork data? It would be really tempting now to go on a detailed scientific discussion about all the things that I'm doing with the artwork data, but there's just not going to be time for that. And it's too detailed, and it excites me too much, which means it won't excite you anywhere near enough. So uh, let me tell you the big picture of what we're trying to do at the moment. I mean, one of the most pressing scientific issues at the moment in the, in the global scientific community is human-induced global climate change. And if we're going to understand where the climate is going in the future, we need to understand the natural climate variability so we can then understand what we're doing on top of that. And it turns out there's some evidence that some of the things that I study are part of the natural climate variability, and I'm really interested in that, and we've been trying to study it. So it dates back to a paper published by Eugene Rosanov, who is uh, now in Switzerland, has been in Switzerland for um, many decades, and he had a, a chemistry climate model, which is basically a form of a climate model, but it's got atmospheric chem chemistry in it, and he put this hot precipitation into the model and did a run with precipitation and a run without precipitation, and we did look what the differences were. And uh, I'm sorry this is a black and white, this was, you know, this is 10 years ago, back when we had to pay a lot of money to put colour in journals, so we did things in black and white a lot. Um, he ended up with this temperature pattern 
with temperature increases. So here's Britain and there's uh, the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal. Uh, there's Alaska, just to give you a feeling. So that's the far edge of Russia. There's Japan, there's Greenland. So we have a hot region over here. We have a cold region in here and we have a hot region in there. And when he did this model, he found that he was modulating what atmospheric scientists call the northern annular mode. So he was changing one of the temperature responses in the atmosphere. And then a few years after that, my good friend and colleague Arnika Seppala from Finland went away and looked at a bunch of experimental climate measurements, which had then been processed and put them on a nice grid because it's so much easier to work with data that's gridded. But you start with real measurements and then you do various things to grid them. And she looked at the difference between times when we expect high precipitation and times when we expect low precipitation and she saw a fairly similar pattern of sort of hottish and, and, and cold and warm and also a pattern in the Antarctic. And so we're really interested as to why this might be. And there are other people here in LASP, well actually in that building in LASP, but part of LASP, who are also really interested in why this could be. The mechanism we think is going on is this. You get particle precipitation and it changes the chemistry in the upper atmosphere. It produces what is called NOx, which is odd nitrogen, and OX, which HOX, HOX, which is odd hydrogen. Now at this point, if there's any chemists in the room, I'm sorry, I'm not a chemist, I don't understand it, I don't know why anybody is interested. But um, <laughs> HOX and NOx in my head are Pac-Men. Remember Pac-Man? Okay, they're Pac-Men. They're sitting in the atmosphere and they float around and when they get to ozone, they go gobble, gobble, gobble and they eat the ozone. I'm told the correct phrase for this is catalytic destruction. They catalytically destroy ozone, which basically means that they don't go away, but the ozone does. So they're just like Pac-Man, gobble, 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 gobble. And they go around the atmosphere eating ozone. And NOx is particularly interesting because it's destroyed by sunlight. Okay, so you shine sunlight on it and it goes away. Pac-Men die. But particle precipitation happens at high latitudes. And in the high latitude in the winter, the sun does not come up for a few months. And so you have this population of Pac-Men that can just do their thing. Okay? And um, that can lead to a destruction of ozone. Ozone's a really important gas in the atmosphere because it absorbs the really energetic parts of sunlight, and in absorb, which means that we don't get bad skin cancer here because all of that really energetic sunlight is being absorbed in the atmosphere. By doing that, it heats the atmosphere up. So if you have less ozone, you get less heating. And when you have less hot, well, then you're going to change the winds because winds basically, you know, things going from hot to cold and that sort of pressure change. As you can tell, I'm not a metrologist either. <laughs> okay? And, and then it sort of feels like that probably could connect to climate. That might explain what's going on. So now, let me be completely upfront with you. This happens, we've seen that happen, we've seen this happen in experimental data. We're still looking for that, and we're trying to understand this bit. Okay, so I can't tell you that this is real, I can tell you that this is what I'm excited about, and I'm trying to work with people on, and we're trying to work out if this is important, or not important. And it might be either, so we have to work on it to work out. Let me just quickly show you some evidence why we think it's important. Uh, some years ago, I used aardvark data to be able to work out what the precipitating flux is, the electron flux into the atmosphere, how strong was Marvin the Martian's gun. And then we put it into a chemistry model, and for that time period, we were able to make lots of next extra knocks, and we thought, oh, that's so exciting. And then we used the chemistry model to see how much ozone would go away. And we found the answer was about 1%. And the atmosphere people said, no, that's not exciting. So, oh, that's sad. But then we realized that we did this experiment in September when the sun was shining. And so we did what Einstein would call a Gedanken experiment, a thought experiment. We just moved it to the winter and redid the, the modeling because the winter atmosphere is different. And so we get a pulse of the odd nitrogen. And then when we go away and look at what happens to the high altitude ozone, we get changes like uh, 20 or even 30% decreases. And the atmospheric people say, oh yes, that's very exciting. Okay, so I was very pleased with this because this was a paper that I wrote, it was a modeling paper, and it said, theory suggests this should work. So 
So it took a little bit longer before we were able to show it in experimental data, but let's go through the story. So then the British Antarctic Survey put a ground-based instrument staring up at the sky that could see the production of NOx in the atmosphere and found during storms when precipitation occurred, they could see pulses of NOx. My uh, friend and collaborator, Monica Anderson from uh, Finland, went away and looked at NASA MLS spacecraft data and she was able to see correlations with increased HOX, which is the other Pac-Man, in the atmosphere during the times of uh, intense precipitation. And she was able to see HOX increases down to 52 kilometers, which is surprisingly close to the ground. And then, after a while of sitting down and talking and lots of arguing um, with, uh, as to how we were going to do it, we were able to work out what we needed to do and we looked at the ozone data. And this study was read, led again by Monica Anderson. And we looked at time periods where we knew there was intense electron precipitation and we looked at how the ozone changed with time. And yes, we found decreases of 10, 20, 30 percent on average after these storms. And I was so happy because that was a bit like my study from five years before. But that was a modeling study and this is real. This is actual measurements made from space looking at Earth's atmosphere. And it turns out that when you look at the ozone profile, how much ozone is there with altitude, and you contrast the year, the blue line with lots of precipitation, and the red line, which is a year without much precipitation, the average amount of ozone at high altitudes is lower in the years with lots of precipitation. These electron precipitation events, they only last a few days, but they're really common. And so we think they sum up to being important on average, which means they might be important in a wider sense, but they might not be. That's what we need to do next. And in fact, that's we, what we really want to do is be able to take the electron precipitation and put it in the climate models, these really complicated climate models, and see what happens. And so um, there are people here from NCAR who are working on changing the model to be able to put the precipitation in. And what we need to do as a space physics community and my collaborators is give them a good product, give them measurements of precipitation that are like reality, not bad. We need good stuff. So when they put it on the climate model, they can say, yes, that's important, or no, it's not important, or, or something you know, clear like that would be good. Okay, so that's what, that's what I'm doing, and in fact, that's one of the reasons that I'm here at LASP. Um, I'm here on a New Zealand Fulbright Fellowship, and I've been working with uh, different groups in the labor Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics here in Boulder, Colorado, because there are people here who are really interested in those chemical changes in the atmosphere, and there's people here who are really interested in the hot particles of the magnetic field, and I'm here to cause them to have a little marriage briefly and talk about where they overlap, because that's the bit that I'm really interested in. And, you know, if it requires the occasional beer or whatever, that's fine too. Okay, I want to end with a little show and tell number. I'm going to take you back in time again to the International Geophysical Year, 1957 and 1958, because in that year, New Zealand set up its Antarctic base down here, Scott Base, in collaboration with the United States. And given I'm here in collaboration with the United States, I thought I'd talk about our Antarctic base. And at least in New Zealand, people are interested in Antarctica. And so I'm going to force you to have this experience briefly. Okay, so Scott Base is down here. It's on an island. Uh, it's called Ross Island. Um, this is, a, this is a, a great picture with Rear Admiral George Dufik, who I think at the time was the head of McMurdo, which is one of the big United States bases, which is basically on the other side of the hill from Scott Base, i.e. it's about a 10 minute drive on a road in a pickup truck. I know Antarctica is not meant to be like that, that's probably not your mental picture of Antarctica. It's not a great road, it's a gravel road, but it's a road, um, and, and yeah. So uh, Scott Base was actually set up by Ed Hillary. You may have heard of Ed Hillary. Um, he was the first man to climb Everest and was a New Zealander, just to emphasise that New Zealand link. Um, he's also on our $5 note, and he was on our $5 note before he died. Most people don't get that, unless you're the Queen. The Queen is also on one of our notes, um, and she's not dead. But Ed Hillary is dead now, but for a long time he was on our money, and he's still on our money while being alive. Um, okay, so if you wanted to get to Scott Base, you fly from Christchurch. If you want to get to McMurdo, the American base, you fly from Christchurch. Please come and visit Christchurch. It's a great place and it had a big earthquake. Its economy needs improving. So please come and spend money. Um, it's about two and a half thousand miles from Christchurch to Scott Base. 
Um, if you're a scientist or you're working to assist the Antarctic programs, you can go down there. If you're a tourist, you go on a cruise boat. This bit of water here is very bumpy, I understand. Like, very bumpy. I'm not sure that would be fun. Flying's fine. So before you go to Antarctica, I told you this was going to be a bit show and tell, um, you go to the Antarctica New Zealand supply base and they give you all the clothing you're going to need. You basically show up with a supply of socks and underwear and a light shirt or two to wear on base because apparently it's bad manners to wear the outside clothes inside the base. So, you know, you have some t-shirts and things. But they give you all the clothing you need. They give you boots that make you feel like a, a, a moon astronaut because they've got inch thick soles. And, and many different jackets and clothing and all sorts of gloves and paraphernalia. <laughs> and then the next morning, carrying all of this gear, you go out to the plane. And if you're very lucky, you're going to fly on a US Air Force Globemaster III. And I really like this plane. The reason I really like this plane is that it has jet engines. <laughs> the other option is a C-130 Hercules. It might be a US Air Force One, it might be a Royal New Zealand Air Force One. Either way, that has propellers. This has jet engines. This takes five hours. The Hercules take eight hours, unless they're the ones with skis. And because they have skis hanging off the bottom, they take nine hours. <laughs> okay, this one has a big fuel tank, so it can fly all the way down, get there and hang around for a while to see if the weather gets better, and then make a landing maybe. The propeller ones can fly to about six or seven hours away, and then decide if the weather is good, and if the weather is bad, they go back to Christchurch. So you've just been flying 12 hours to go back to where you started from, and tomorrow you'll do it again. I like the C-17s. The C They're great. They're a little bit interesting inside. I mean, it is a proper military transport. They actually have a little wire on the edge with instructions on how to clip onto it if you're a paratrooper. It's really cool. Um, yeah, they sometimes put airline seats in the middle if there's lots of people. I just prefer to sit down the edge because it's more comfortable. And um, they have little windows, which you can see amazing pictures, amazing views from, glaciers and mountains. And then eventually you get there, and this big plane does its thing on the ice runway, and then you show up at Scott Base. So uh, this was the sign that used to be on the edge of Scott Base, proclaiming all the services that you could get access to while you were there, toilets, telephones, petrol, it's got a boat ramp, uh, got internet services. Uh, unfortunately, that sign has been removed. The, uh, the International Commission that controls access to Antarctica, because we've all signed an agreement saying we're not allowed to claim it, it's sort of held for everybody. They looked at this and went, capital of the Ross dependency. No, no, that's a territorial claim. And they made New Zealand take this sign down. Hopefully you can appreciate that it was meant to be humorous. This was not our attempt to say, this is ours. <laughs> A bit, a bit irritating. All the, all the buildings on Scott Base are painted green. I'm told it's to remind you of home. I don't know, but it's nice. The ones in McMurdo are largely sort of tan, maybe brown. I don't really want to describe you exact what color comes to mind, but it's sort of tanny brown. Okay, so inside, that's the canteen. We eat really well. I mean, you know, I like food. You can look at me and tell, yeah? We eat really well down there. Last year I was down and the deputy chef had previously worked in a Michelin-style restaurant in Switzerland. And he was the number two chef. The number one chef was a specialist pastry cook who made us lots and lots of cakes and lots and lots of um, savoury things for morning and afternoon tea. I asked that on, on Sundays we get brunch so that the chefs can sleep in. We don't have breakfast, we have a sort of combined brunch lunch. I asked the chef if I could have permission to take this photograph and she was very troubled because they'd already eaten so much of it. She, she, there was a lot less food than there was meant to be and she really didn't want me to take a photograph when there wasn't heaps of food there. There's always heaps of food. Um, if you go over to the American base, there is a Frosty Boy machine and a Frosty Girl machine. It's like a self-serve ice cream machine. You can just walk up and go <laughs> into a cup. A couple of years ago, they decided the people over there were getting a, a bit too big, and they took the handle away. And they only brought it out at meal times. And so the engineers carved handles and would hire them to you if you wanted to help yourself to the Frosty Boy or Frosty Girl machine. Okay? It's a different world. <laughs> um, particularly for during those long winters when you're trapped in base, which of course I've never been, I only go down in the summertime. There's lots of nice uh, tourism type shots. New Zealand, and we all stay in dorm rooms, 
and there's always going to be one or two guys inside your dorm room, dorm room who snore heavily. Um, one advantage though is that because the sun is always up, um, you don't have curtains, you have wooden shutters. When you close the shutters, it will be dark, no light will get in. And in fact, they've even got a little lock thing to hold them shut. Okay, uh, I do want to point out this recent New Zealand-US co collaboration. It's called the Ross Island Wind Farm. Uh, for quite a while, there was some worry that New Zealand wasn't pulling its, pulling its share in the collaboration, because obviously without the flights from the US Air Force and the big uh, United States icebreaker, the New Zealand base wouldn't be there. So uh, they went away and spent some money and put these big wind turbines in. And they also electrically linked Scott Base and McMurdo together. And uh, this has been really useful in that it's de decreased the amount of diesel that's burnt down at um, Scott Base and McMurdo together by about 11%, which is an awful lot of gallons of diesel. And one thing they always tell us when we're down there is that for every gallon of diesel that you use in McMurdo, at least another gallon has been, has been burnt to get it there. Okay, so that gives quite a big saving all by itself. Uh, the other thing, it gave it a, a, a larger reduction than they were expecting because it turns out that McMurdo has these huge generators, really big generators, to generate electricity. And when they get close to, oh dear, we're not got enough electricity, we're about to run out of electricity, so they start up another huge generator and it burns a lot of diesel. When they join the two bases up, they discovered that what they needed to do is if they need just a little bit more electricity, they ask Scott Base to turn on its tiny little generator. Because it's a small, I mean this is, uh, Scott Base is like 80, 80 to 90 people in the winter, sorry in the summer, and 12 to 15 in the winter. And McMurdo is, well hundreds in the winter and 1500 to 2000 at peak in the summer. You know, big. So I'm um, running just using the little New Zealand generator to just top up the load turns out that saved them a whole lot of power, irrespective of having these big wind turbines. So let's talk about these have been very successful. They were actually paid for by New Zealand, just to show that New Zealand is paying for something. Um, and uh, there's talk of putting more of them up the hill. Right, um, I, I just mentioned that uh, my antenna is not very big. It's quite small, but that's what I went down last year to go do some maintenance on it, which was rather good. And uh, there's always a lot of people down in my physics department. Uh, there are some sea ice researchers, and actually I just wanted to say, that's my boss, that's Pat Langhorn, who just happened to be down there working, doing sea ice work, so we had to get this nice photograph. We've upgraded the, uh, the Scott Bay sign to have more Maori culture around it and on it, uh, which is a big part of New Zealand culture. And uh, it's quite interesting, the view out the window, is that gonna work? Yes. The view out the window is an active volcano. This is Mount Erebus. It's the view in the backdrop. Um, it doesn't actually change that fast. We went out for uh, a while and took a photograph every 10 seconds for 20 minutes and then spliced it together to make that. But it is just sitting there quietly steaming. And so one day Scott Bass and McMurdo won't be there. Um, but it is very attractive. You know, that's the, that's the, there's the Erebus there. That's the backdrop uh, in a lot of our photographs. Okay, and yes, uh, one day I went out and there was this huge ice ring in the sky and so I got to put my head right there and give myself a huge halo and I thought that was great. So thank you very much for listening to me and being part of this public talk and um, I need to acknowledge my funding sources from New Zealand and Europe and of course the Fulbright Foundation who is paying for me to be here and LASP who are hosting me giving me the opportunity to talk to you and providing biscuits and stuff. And um, yeah, thank you very much. because it's in two low magnetic latitudes, but I can imagine that the square kilometre array will produce a lot of other interesting science that, I and mean, it's not, the plan for the square kilometre array is obviously to do deep space astronomy, but they've already, as, a, as an unintended byproduct, when they were trying to explain some noise sources in their data, gone away and seen things in the space close to Earth that we never managed to visualise before. And I think that was a master's student who was just trying to understand some strange patterns. And it was published in one of the foremost journals of our field, GRL. 
Uh, it's really cool. So, yeah. yeah, it's a classic science, isn't it? You go away and if you actually are willing to look under the rock, you'll probably find something that you're not expecting. But obviously you picked up the rock because you had a feeling there was something shiny under there. Well, that's how we get the money. But, um, but there's probably going to be other shiny things under the rock too. You had mentioned that Pose just measures a small part of the velocity. Is it possible to build an instrument that would measure the flux for all four high stratings at um, good resolution? I have heard people talking about it, and it seems hard. But I have heard people talking about it. And it's a question of, see, while people like me and Cora Randall from LASP are running around saying this is exciting, there's probably a higher chance that somebody might be willing to build and fly such an instrument. I believe there is a CU in the physics department, there's a Colorado University uh, graduate group trying to build a resolved particle instrument as we talk, but not, not for pi, just trying to look inside the lost current. But, you know, yeah, stuff is happening. Is the major issue with that maintaining your pointing accuracy with an actual lost current? There's that and there's also the saturation problem. If you're going to measure numbers that are as small as what's in the loss current, um, you are probably not going to be able to measure the trapped population. And um, so one way would be, yes, to try and stare down the loss current, stare down the magnetic field. That's going to be really hard. So what people have talked about is spinning. And then you'll pass through that angular range occasionally. But um, that has the downside that you'll spend most of your time saying, the number's too big, the number's too big, the number's too big, the number's too big. Oh, I can measure, I can measure, I can measure. Oh, now it's too big. And so for most of the time you're spinning, you'll just get rubbish data. And a lot of people don't want to fund instruments that spend most of their time just saying, it's too hard, it's too hard, it's too hard. So. And so there's some lovely instruments being flown up there now. It's just they don't look at the whole scope. Thank you for coming. Thank you.